<laughs> I guess I better say something really good now. <laughs> I intend to. Welcome. Are you guys all rested up from uh, the break? Good. Right. You know, all stretched up. Now, uh, these shirts are no longer for sale. I uh, just want to tout it and say sucks to be you because uh, I, I got one and you didn't. Somebody created this logo for me. And um, I uh, sold these uh, for, um, you know, a little while and then somehow I lost the password <laughs> or something. I don't remember. I don't even know where the site is, but I think I still have the logo. You know, have you taken the outsider test for faith? Now, Anthony, you know, you've got, you've got to get one of these because uh, you use these for, uh, you use that test to help um, people think through their faith. Uh, and I want to tell you a little bit about this. This is actually a very simple uh, test for faith. It's self-administered. I'll tell you more about why that is, because nobody can actually grade the test and say, okay, you pass it, you know, you didn't, except for the person. But it, it does open up channels for, for thought, because what uh, Thomas said earlier uh, in his talk, he said uh, he's dealing with emotional arguments, not intellectual arguments. And uh, that's, what, uh, that's what we do when we're engaging with uh, Christians, who are basically in, engaging their e emotions, because uh, they learn their religion on their mama's knee, and mama can't be wrong. How dare you tell me my mom is wrong? Well, uh, I am, in fact, doing that. How dare you tell me, you know, that when I die, I won't see her again? I'm sorry to tell you that, but, uh, you know, we're uh, all evolved creatures, and we go where all evolved creatures go when they die. Where's that? Well, I think I have an answer. <laughs> so um, we're dealing with emotional arguments, and this is a, a way to help open up their minds. Now, here's something pretty cool. Um, Dr. James Lindsay is a mathematician. He wrote this about the test that it's a silver bullet argument for understanding how to grapple with the religious diversity of our world and how to answer the central question raised by it. How can we know which religion, if any, is true? Now, I, I like quoting people like this for some odd reason. I mean, I, 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 wouldn't you? I mean, like if somebody had said something about what you, know, you, you wrote and they said, well, that's, that's pretty cool. I'm gonna like share that and then shuffle my feet and act really humble like, you know, I didn't do that. I'm not claiming that, he did. I think it's pretty cool. And the title of the book is uh, something I had to debate my publisher about. You know the subtitle? How to Know Which Religion is True. Somehow they wanted to end on that positive note. Because what, what does that subtitle uh, presuppose? That one of them is true. I had argued, hey, publishers don't always you know, do what I tell them to do. <laughs> and if you hadn't known that, uh, and you probably did, how to know which religion is true if there is one, is what I insisted on the uh, subtitle being. Um, but they chose, to, uh, they, th they thought this would sell better. So that's how publishers work, just so you know. Uh, there's some titles to my books that I didn't want. Uh, that's just the way it is. And uh, you just go with it. Richard Carrier, you may know him. He said, though this idea has been voiced before, Loftus is the first to name it, rigorize it, and give it an extensive philosophical defense. The end result is one of the most effective and powerful arguments for atheism there is. It is, in effect, a covering argument that subsumes all other arguments for atheism into a common framework. Now, here I am shuffling my feet again. I didn't say that. I can act humble, you see. <laughs> I, actually, the truth is I'm very happy I stumbled on it because <laughs> that's all it is. And I wasn't the only one. Um, everybody who's ever rejected religion has taken the test. So um, it's not anything unique with me. It's just uh, what I've done is... Um, <clears throat> I have uh, engaged Christian philosophers on this test. I haven't yet told you what it is. I've engaged them, uh, and they have engaged me, because they don't like the test. And so I have in, in my arsenal, if you will, uh, a whole bunch of their arguments, you know, that, and I deal with those arguments. So this is a manual for uh, how to uh, you know, help Christians realize the test is important by answering those objections that they might come up with uh, as you talk with them. And uh, I've heard it all. And uh, that, that book is in a way to, uh, to help um, uh, them see that they should take the test. Now, um, I'm not here to peddle my books or anything like that, but this is my next one coming out. And what I am trying to do, what I'm trying to do with the Outsider Test for Faith is to get them to consider science. That's, that's basically what the outsider test for faith is asking people to do, and that is to test your faith as you do an outsider. Well, how does an outsider test someone's faith, someone else's faith that you reject? Well, you do throw, do throw for, from science. Uh, take, for instance, the Mormon church. They said that um, Israelites traveled over to America in 600 B.C., you know, across the Atlantic. They came to America in 600 B.C. That's the story in the Book of the Mormon, right? Well, DNA evidence has... Uh, 
shown that uh, after testing 150 plus Native American tribes, they don't have any uh, Semitic blood in them. <laughs> and so that basically says the Book of Mormon is a book of fiction. We know this. It's a lie. It's false. We know this. And it's yet one of the fastest growing religions around. <laughs> There's something wrong out there, right? Well, um, Christianity is wrong equally. You know, it's false equally. And because I think science shows why. Now, in this book, I have Guy Harrison. You might have heard of him. He's written a number of books. He wrote a book. Uh, he wrote a chapter called How to Think Like a Scientist. And he says, every Christian can and should embrace this thinking. And that's a good chapter. David Eller uh, writes, How Evolved Cognitive Biases Lead to Religion and Other Mental Errors. Um, Victor Stenger, this, is, uh, this book contains the very last chapter. He died a few, couple years ago. He sent it to me for this book before he died. And he writes a, a chapter on uh, Christianity and cosmology. You know, it's a really important chapter. You have to read it to see it. Uh, Christian cosmology is just bonkers. <laughs> Religion is uh, bonkers. Phil Hopper and Ali Nari. They wrote a chapter called Before the Big Bang. You do realize, of course, there was a before the Big, the big Bang, right? There was a before. And then Abby Hafer writes a chapter called Intelligent Design Isn't Science and Why It Doesn't Even Try to Be Science. It's about data. They don't talk about data. My favorite part of this book is the Science and Salvation. Uh, Robert Price and, and Edward Sunanen, they said, uh, they argued that you should say sayonara to sin. Well, why should you say sayonara to sin? Well, now we know there was no Adam and Eve from, from, uh, the, uh, from genetics and from uh, evolutionary theory. And uh, they say, that, no, without an Adam and Eve, there isn't an original sin. Without an original sin, there is no need for salvation or a savior. Of course, I go on to say, then probably there isn't a creator as well. Uh, Julian uh, Mussolino says uh, in his chapter, The Soul Fallacy, that there is overwhelming evidence against the soul. Uh, Jonathan Pierce writes a chapter called uh, on Simply Free Will. <laughs> He's against it, you know, the evidence is against it. Uh, science, uh, the, second, uh, the fourth part is Science in the Bible, where we talk um, biblical archaeology. And if you want to know uh, what the, the archaeological evidence is about the Exodus and, and uh, the city of Nazareth at the time of Jesus, those, are, those contain some good chapters. And the final part, we examine the Bethlehem star, we examine the, uh, effic effic eff uh, the um, efficaciousness of petitionary prayer, and the Shroud of Turin. I don't know why I'm stumbling here, but I am. So uh, what, the, what the outsider test of faith is doing is it's pointing to things like this. You need to be open-minded to science, because that's what an open-minded person is. An open-minded person is a person who is open-minded to the consensus of, science, of the scientific community. That's what an open-minded person. A closed-minded person is not. And there's a lot of science deniers out there, you know, some, people who just simply deny the science. Why? For emotional reasons. The outsider test for faith is to help them open their minds to scientific evidence. That's why Jerry Coyne in his book, uh, Faith Versus Facts, says that the outsider test for faith is a quasi-scientific um, uh, uh, principle. It's trying, to try, it's trying to solve the problem of religious diversity. And if you knew world history very well, you would know that religions are uh, separated into di distinct geographical places on the earth due to wars. and battles, and movements of people. It's true. Uh, and isn't that really an odd way to spread religion? <laughs> I mean, not truth, not argument. Wars. And, uh, and yet we can't convince one another of, of you know, our religion or, or your religion. We, we end, endlessly beat up on each other, and then we kill each other over it. So uh, if nothing has worked before, what can work now? Well, we have to get all of them to think scientifically. That's it. And uh, that's what this test is trying to do. This is a uh, former youth pastor of mine. He thought he would come around and straighten me after, you know, uh, not seeing him for a couple of decades. And uh, so he came and he wanted to have dinner with me. We had dinner. This is not the dinner meeting, of course. This is a picture I got off a line. But during the, uh, and you should know, I mean, it would be hot if, if you're eating dinner and he's standing over you. But um, and he, he, looks, he, looks a little, he looks a little older than I, when I remember him, of course, uh, and so do I. But he closed his eyes 
I, while he was talking to me, and he just wanted to convince me that Jesus is real and all this stuff. He, he closes his eyes, and when he does that, I, I always knew I was in trouble, you know, as a, as a youth, you know. I know that I know that what I believe is true. I mean, just, he says it so much better than I do. I mean, you know, he, he almost convinced me. <laughs> but it didn't do any good, you see, because what he was telling us all, because I, I wrote about it, is that uh, he's certain. And certain is good, see. I don't know anybody in the world who thinks certainty is good. When it comes to religious questions, moral questions, and other sorts of questions. Uh, so that is the problem as well as the religious diversity itself. Faith is the problem. Uh, believers already think they are objective and fair with their faith. Just ask the, uh, I mean, you're, they're dead now, but just ask the Muslims who flow, uh, flown uh, planes into buildings if they are certain of their faith. I mean, how could they not be? I mean, they had to be. Uh, just like John Lloyd, uh, that, that previous slide. So what we need is some test that has a teeth to it, a bite to it, something that actually can change their minds, if their minds can be changed at all. And I'm not actually saying they can. It's really difficult even at that. Uh, because believers must be convinced their faith is impossible before they will see it as improbable. Well, that's really an odd way to approach something. But the reason why we have to convince uh, their, uh, that them, their faith is impossible is because of um, the, the, the doctrine of hell. I, I know that when I left my faith and I see Dan walked in, he, he would concur and in his book, I think he said as much, uh, that you have to be sure you're, you're, you're wrong. You have to be sure you're wrong before you actually abandon your faith. Why? Because you could always, if you're just even, you know, if there's a possibility that you're, uh, you're wrong, you could go to hell. So you, they must be convinced that their faith is impossible before they were considered improbable. Why can't we just stay with the probabilities, you know, and realize that Allah has a hell too, and so do the snake handlers. <laughs> I mean, you know, if you, wanted to, if you wanted to take that into consideration, then almost all faith with, with uh, hell's uh, doctrine would uh, be impossible to leave. But people leave, to it, leave it, and they try to get me back into the fold. Well, I've already considered the evidence. I've already decided that the, that the evidence is just so minusculely possible that I'm not even afraid of an eternal hell. You're not going to change my mind now. After all that. And because believers usually cannot be reasoned out of their faith because they were never reasoned into it in the first place. Usually. They're just born into it. You know, into a culture that has indoctrinated them into it. So um, again, we need, we need something more than a milk toast test. We need something that has teeth to it. Because snake handlers were raised snake handlers, Mormons were raised no Mormons, Pentecostals were raised Pentecostal, Catholics, Muslims will raise the, their own progeny as well. Now here's the solution. Uh, isn't that a surprise? Science has a consensus eventually. You know, not necessarily on the cutting edges, but eventually they come to a consensus. And look, you don't find scientists disagreeing with things like plate tectonics or quantum theory. Well, there's some disagreements, of course, but they, they understand what it is. A uh, Big Bang Theory, um, and that's not the uh, sitcom that I think is quite funny, the, uh, the theory of evolution. You know, I actually like to call that the paradigm of solution. I, I, I want to I get people to change their minds about what you call it. Call it the paradigm, and I'm sure that it will never work because nobody will listen to me about that sort of stuff. Uh, atomic theory, chromosome theory of inheritance, all these things. These are things that convince scientists, and they all agree. Where, where's the agreement between religionists? Do I need to go back to that earlier picture of the world, where, where it showed the religions of the world. Um, so science is a solution. Now, how are you going to get people, to, believers, to consider science when most of what they uh, have is because they were raised that way or because of emotional reasons? That's what the, uh, the uh, test is about. So here we go. It's highly likely that adopting one's religious faith is causally dependent on cultural conditions. Now, it might be over, I mean, it's, it's more than highly. It might be overwhelmingly highly. It might be certain. You know, there's a certainty. There could be certain tendencies. I didn't say there weren't. Um, but it's, so I reduced the claim a little bit. The, the lower the, the level of, of threshold of claim, the higher po probability you're right. The, the higher the claim, the less likely you're probably right. The highly, it's, so it's highly likely that adopting one's religious faith is culturally dependent on one's cultural conditions. Your mama, for instance, taught you. And um, why do we think that's unreliable? Well, because other mamas do the same thing around the world and in other parts of the world and other times uh, uh, in eras. Back two, therefore the odds are highly likely that any given adopted religious faith is false. I mean, this is undeniable. 
You know, you'd have to have some burden of proof to, to overcome to show that your faith is more reliable than others. Well, no, I have more evidence my faith is more reliable. But you're taught that way. You're taught to evaluate the evidence based on your mama's knee. And you're, and you're taught to be a science denier when it comes to those you disagree. So here's the test. It didn't take too long, did it? The only way to test one's adopted religious faith is from the perspective of a non-believer with the same reasonable skepticism used to evaluate other religious faiths. I highlighted the, the yellow words because I like the word, I mean, I like yellow. I mean, just, I just like to just, you know, it kind of like highlights, you know, and uh, so it makes it, you know, readable. The only, I'm not saying it's not, it's not one, I'm not saying it's merely an alternative. I have considered the alternatives. I've considered six different alternatives in my book anyway, and I, I thought, well, I thought I researched it pretty well. I mean, if you can come up with me a different alternative, then I'll consider that. But from what I can gather, that's the only way to test one's adopted religious faith, and that is from the perspective of a non-believer. That is the person who doesn't believe. See, I don't, I don't say it's, you know, prejudges any uh, preclusion, uh, um, precondition that it's got to be atheism, just somebody who doesn't believe. Just like we don't believe the Mormon faith because we are not Mormons. You know, and we don't accept the uh, Jehovah's Witness faith because we're not Jehovah's Witnesses or um, Muslims or what have you. Someone who's outside that particular faith with the same reasonable skepticism. And that's a reasonable skepticism. You can't say your religious faith is wrong because mine is right. That's unreasonable. And the re reason why it's unreasonable is because first you've got to show your religion is right. So you have to have a reasonable one, one that treats the other religions just the same, or your own religions just the same as you uh, test your own. That's it. See, I, what I'm saying is really easy to understand. And when they say, well, you know what, well, you got to subject your own faith, you know, well, I'm sorry, I'm a non believer, you know, and just like you are a non believer, you know, um, there's something called wide atheists, like uh, myself. I, uh, I reject all religions for the same reasons, Not insufficient sufficient, uh, evidence. And then there are narrow atheists. Those are people who are believers who reject all religions but their own. Well, so we all know what it's like to be a non-believer. You just not, you know, I've talked to the Christians, you're just not a non-believer with regard to your own uh, faith. Now, I, you know, I didn't do, I didn't time myself, so I don't know, um, I, could, I could wax on for two or three hours. You know, I mean, I, I, usually the timer then it buzzes and, I'm, and I know I'm done, so... Uh, if, if, if you start walking out on me at any point, then uh, I think I'll have to like, count for at least five of you walk out. Then I know it must be time to stop because, uh, all right, fine. All right. I'll give you a card. Thank you so much. <laughs> <laughs> that was really nice. Is that, a, is that an accurate representation? Uh, no, not yet. All right, all right. You got a while. All right. Okay, good. Now, here's where you find... Here's where you find religion showing up in any given culture. You, you find religion showing up in the language, the critical life events, everyday habits, bodily habits, institutions, and space and time. You, you find that in every different culture, depending on the culture that you're in. Uh, in our culture, in the, the West, usually, language such as um, uh, sacred, divine, baptism, purgatory, gospel, uh, God bless, uh, Mark of Cain, K Garden of Eden, David versus Goliath, uh, Goliath, sorry, uh, Jacob's Ladder, Patience of Job, My Cross to Bear, Spare the Rod, The Spoil of Child. That's not actually a Bible passage. I don't even know why that's here. Uh, beat Swords into Plowshares and Voice Crying in the Wilderness and uh, you know, all sorts of things. Physician, Heal Thyself. You know, uh, these are the sorts of things that are coming from the Bible or the Christian theology. And these are things that you hear in, the, in your culture and they point to Christianity. Uh, critical life events like birth, marriage, and death, you know, Religion shows up there, you know, baptizing the babies, you know, doing the marrying uh, and then doing the burying. Uh, habits, the foods we eat. In this religion, no pork. In that religion, no beef. In the other religion, no meat on Friday or no meat at all. In names, in, in uh, the Judeo-Christianity boys, uh, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. I wonder why. Anybody have a clue in why Matthew, Mark? Yeah, okay. Uh, in um, and the Beatles, right? <laughs> and for girls, it's Mary, Ruth, Ra Rachel, Eve, and bodily habits, hair. Many Protestants think that the hair should be plain for women and short for men. That's why I like to wear my hair long. I just got a haircut, too. And uh, if those of you who wear tattoos, I encourage it because those are forbidden. I mean, these are all cult counter, that's right, these are all counter, counter cultural sorts of things. Spike, you know, your hair, you know, put, uh, um, 
piercings in, in your face. You know, I just, uh, I've, I've lived this long and uh, so I'm not, not uh, those, those things that go are countercultural uh, are actually important. It's just like sexism. Sexism needs to be abolished, you see, so we, can't, we have to start changing our language. And so if we want Christianity to be abolished, that I do, I think it's a, a, not a good thing, I'll just say it, stop there, uh, that we need to change our language. We need to change our language, we need to change our culture. Uh, I said this to uh, Professor uh, Cheryl Exum. She, she uh, and I uh, and others were on a panel, and she was all against uh, changing sexist language. And I was exactly for her, you know, in that. But I said, you know, we need to change our uh, our godlike language too, because the godlike language in any given culture uh, convinces just as sexist language has its effect that we want to get rid of. Uh, when it comes to space and uh, oh, institutions, I'm uh, yeah, okay, uh, that. And then when it comes to space, like uh, you have Rome, that's for Catholics, Jerusalem for Jews and, um, Ara and Arabs, Muslims, and Salt Lake City for Mormons, and Mecca for uh, Muslims. I mean, you have the time of the, of the year is 2016. Why, why is that? Well, they got it wrong, of course, <laughs> if they think that um, they calculated their dates correctly. But these, these, are all, these are all Christianized sorts of things that have, has a way. I mean, there are cities that are named... Um, St. Augustine down in Florida, you know, there's cities all over the, the states. If you can, you know, we can get those uh, cities re to rename themselves, that would be good too. I'm sure that uh, won't uh, be coming anytime soon though. Um, then uh, the uh, psychological data supports it. Oops. I mean, we know these things. You know, we, we know that uh, we, are, we detect uh, agents behind um, random events. That's what the brain does. You know, we, do, we see faces where there aren't, and uh, I've thought about making a million dollars by somehow creating a, the Virgin Mary's face on a potato chip or something like that, but I don't have the technology as of yet, or the know-how, you know. Uh, we, we, know we know we do this, and so, uh, you know, when a thunderstorm came, or, you know, uh, we, ancient people would think that God's angry, you know, well, you won a war, they would think that uh, God's happy with you, you're doing something good. And um, uh, people still do that today, we're, we're not all that much different, and we're not all that rational. Um, uh, the, the, uh, the, the brain lies to us. I make a, a big point of that. Of course, uh, that's because I've learned from those who've done the studies that mean we prefer to believe what makes us happy, what's familiar. And we will, we will defend what we have been raised to believe. We will defend what we prefer to believe over solid, objective evidence to the contrary. And so uh, the outsider test for faith is, uh, is challenging people who are raised on their you know, mama's knees to, uh, to, to to look at the actual science, to, to look at the science of it all. Uh, we mentioned certainty, <clears throat> cognitive bias, the mother of all cognitive biases is confirmation theory, or co confirmation bias, where you seek to confirm that which you want to believe. It's a mother of all cognitive biases. And the outsider test for faith asks you to consider not confirming your faith, consider your faith as an outsider, because until your confirmation bias can actually kick in, you have to have something to confirm. Okay, so if you act and think like you aren't confirming anything and you're actually evaluating it and, uh, and, and you, you take the evidence seriously, then you've eliminated at least partially the effect of confirmation bias. What would it mean to me if um, I evaluated this faith as an outsider would? Well, these are real problems. I can, I can see that. You know, if nothing else, you can get a, a believer to, to say, you know, I can see uh, why that might be a difficult thing. And if you can get them to do that, then you're on the way. And more facts. Oops, keep going too far. Uh, some things I've already said. Uh, these, all, these all call into question anyone who says, well, you know, I know Jesus rose from the dead. And why? How, how, can you, how can you say that? You don't even believe Benny Hinn does miracles. And uh, that's in today's world. Well, if that's in the, today's world, you don't believe Benny, Din, Benny Hinn does miracles, then how do you know from all the years and layers of historical records and who knows what, that uh, Jesus rose from the dead or that he exists or anything else? All right, right. What does it demand? It only demands, yeah, it only, it only demands that which you use to evaluate other faiths. You already have those tools in you. Most people do. 
They already have those tools. They are, people know what it's like to be skeptical. They know what it's like to trust science. Nobody distrusts science in the modern world entirely. Even the Amish people, they, they trust science uh, to get them from, they'll, they'll always borrow or, or they'll always bum a ride with somebody else who has a vehicle, for instance, you know. Uh, no one uh, distrusts science in every area. It's only in those key areas where, uh, where they believe. You know, only those specific ones. And um, it's just trying to get that uh, to go on. So um, agnosticism is the I don't know position. I call that the default position. And what's going to move me off agnosticism? Well, I'm claiming science does. Um, no special pleading your case. And then, uh, that's all I think believers do because their emotions are engaged. No punting to faith. Let me give you an example of this. When it comes to forgiveness, then uh, Jesus supposes death on the cross for our sins. Um, what's uh, punishment got to do with that? I mean, what's punishment ever have to do with forgiveness of sins? I, I, I don't see any connection with that. Um, I've never had to punish somebody in order to forgive them. In fact, I don't have the right to. And uh, there are people who are punished for crimes that go to jail that people won't forgive even after they've been punished. And there are people who didn't go to jail where the, uh, the victim forgave them even though they never got punished. So you can forgive people without being punished and you can um, punish somebody the ultimate you know, um, punishment and still not forgive. So what is the relationship between punishment and forgiveness? There is none. I mean, there, there really isn't. And it doesn't matter whether it's God or not. I mean, I can just imagine God saying, well, you know, i got to forgive somebody, so I'm going to beat up this guy, name my, my son, apparently, and, and all of a sudden that I can forgive. It. There's nothing related to that. So what I found that the, at that point, a believer will simply say, well, yes, but Hebrews chapter 10, verse you know, 13 or so says otherwise. That's not, you know, you pointed out, you say that, that's not how you would evaluate any other religion. What you would do when you evaluate any other religion is you would actually answer the question. <laughs> now, philosophers have a way of trying to do that, but um, they don't succeed, in my opinion. And the shoulder of the burden of proof. You know, uh, you, there's a big debate as to who has the burden of proof. You know, the one making the extraordinary claim or not. Now, the Christians will say the one making, uh, everybody has, the Christians will say everyone has the burden of proof. Uh, people who are uh, skeptics and scientific minded will say, no, the person making the extraordinary claim has the burden of proof. But if you accept the outsider test for faith, then th that debate has been settled. You no longer have to uh, debate who has the burden of proof, because if you accept the, the uh, basis for the burden of proof and you're looking at a religion from the outside, then you already know which one has the burden of proof. It's the one you're evaluating. And it could be your own if you, d if you take the same critical apparatus and you apply it to your own faith. And methodological naturalism. Every religious faith you evaluate, you do so from the perspective of this is a human author book. This sacred book is not sacred. This, this uh, was authored by a human being, only a human being. Uh, whether you evaluate the Quran or the, the Mormon scriptures or the Bhagavad Gita or something like that, you, what you do is you try to determine if you're looking for evidence. What you do is you try to look for evidence that this has got a divine author behind it. You start with this is a human book. Um, I, and when I look at the Gospels, for instance, I see that Jesus always wins every one of his debates. And I'm thinking to myself, I've never seen a religious debate like that in my life, where Jesus always has the last word. You've heard it said, but I say to you, and all of a sudden, the Pharisees and the scribes and everybody, they stand back in an amazement with his intelligence. Something's going on that's wrong at that point. We're getting propaganda, pure and simple. That's how an outsider would look at the Gospels. All right, Jesus couldn't have won every one of those debates. You, you're saying these people are stupid, that they didn't even consider the alternative? You know, no, no. Well, that's how you would do that there. That's how you do it, because that's how you do it elsewhere. I keep wondering whether I have another one there. I should number these next time. Uh, the double standards, that's basically what it's saying. No double standards. I hate double standards. I mean, I do. Don't you? I, I, except when the judge rules in my favor, of course. <laughs> you know, and, uh, even then, it's not right. I, and that's what this test is asking people to do. D judge your faith by the same standards you uh, judge the ones that you're um, rejecting. Some other things, I write them about them in a book. But bottom line is sufficient objective evidence. And the outsider test for faith is meant to get you to look at subjective or uh, sufficient objective evidence. Any questions about that so far? Yeah. Yeah. Is there a most effective way to adopt a null position? If I mean, since 
I don't know that it's possible for anybody to accept uh, absolutely pure agnosticism uh, culturally. It's impossible to avoid. So is there a way to make yourself more aware of your, your uh, cognitive bias? Well, um, uh, he's asked whether or not uh, agnosticism is uh, uh, possible, right? And how else you could identify your bias, right? Um, well, it's, uh, I, I, let me just give you an example, Ed Babinski. Uh, I don't know if you know him, he's online, he's, he wrote a chapter for one of my books. He's been an agnostic for as long as I've known him. I mean, since uh, maybe 98 or something like that. So uh, let's see, 20 years he's been, almost 20 years he's been an agnostic. I'm, I'm trying to think, come on, Ed, make a decision. I, you know, come on, decide, will you? But he's still an agnostic to the state. So that, and so I see, I see that. And so you say, well, is that impossible? I don't know. I mean, you'd have to talk to Ed Babinski about whether that's possible. But it's ideal, I mean, it's um, ideally possible to say, I don't know. And what that is, is simply to say, uh, for instance, where science hasn't spoken to an issue yet, where the, and especially when the consensus of, science, of the scientific community hasn't be, arrived yet, then it's, it's very consistent to simply say, I don't know. I, I think actually that's the most respectable position to, to have when uh, there's not enough evidence to convince the scientific community of, a, of some kind of a consensus about things, you know. Um, and uh, so I, I say I don't know about a lot of things, you know, um, and, um, and, and it's only about this issue. I mean, I know, I'm, I'm a lot, I know a lot of other things, like this book exists, you know, and, you know, love and friendship and how to get here. At least I thought I knew how to get here. Um, and uh, I know a lot of other things. You know, I'm not talking about I, I don't know about anything. I don't know about the God question. I don't know about science. And uh, I, I dislike some people uh, who think that they understand quantum mechanics when they're amateurs. Uh, I don't mean a dislike. I mean, I, it's, it's really, the Christian will say, well, quantum mechanics says this. You know, and I want to ask him, do you have a degree in this? I don't. I, I don't even understand what you're saying <laughs> sometimes. I mean, I, I don't need to understand what they're saying to know to, to reject faith-based answers. I don't need to understand some things in order to reject faith. Because faith is, uh, has no method, it solves no uh, problems, it answers no questions, uh, and it can uh, fly planes into buildings like Dick Stenger uh, had written. Uh, so as far as uh, that goes, uh, how else can you acknowledge your biases? Well, you know, I've seen that done by Michael Lycona in his book uh, On the Resurrection. And how he does this, he's a believer, how he does this is when he, he says, I want to acknowledge my biases because that's the standard position. I mean, that's what the, they'll do to put it down on paper, these are my biases. He says, I was raised a Christian, and uh, I, you know, I want Christianity to be true. He, he laid out his biases. Well, that doesn't help, see? I mean, th that's the only way they can do it, and just to lay them out. Um, I don't think that actually does it, because I see bias throughout his whole, whole you know, defense of the resurrection. I think, that's why I say the outsider test for faith is the only method, because it asks you to look at your own faith, if possible, you know, um, as an outsider. Now, you're, if you're asking me whether or not it's possible for believers to look at their faith as an outsider, it's, it may not be possible for most of them, but it's a, it's a good hope. It's a good chance. It's a good, it's a good way to uh, have them think about their faith for the first time in their lives. I hope I've answered that question. Uh, I hope I've drummed it into the ground and that and you're not offended and all that stuff. Sir? Okay, from the basis of looking at all religions, if you looked at Christianity, I, I'm not sure on this, I'm not an expert on this, but it tends to treat certain sections of society a little better than others. And I don't want to insult any one of them. So if I'm talking about a family member, and if, if I asked her these questions, she even uh, said that, uh, look at other religions, how they treat women. Yeah, 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 yeah. And that, and that, so she says, she, she says that makes her feel better about her. So how do you, like, you can't say, as an outsider testing your own faith, if you look at other religions, you think, hey, my religion at least treats me better. You know? Oh, you know, uh, Amish, Amish people, maybe even Muslim women would say the same thing. My, my religion, would, I don't know what you're saying. Muslim women might say, my religion treats me better. Is that, and so, so how do you go? Well, I'm, well, actually, I'm going to take that side. I'm, I'm going to say there's a lot of Muslim women who, who probably think that of their faith as well. And uh, so, so, so what we need, okay, what we need, because, look, the Amish people probably think the world would be better if they were all Amish. We, we can't ask them to, to evaluate their faith based on whether or not they like their uh, lifestyle yet. I mean, that's not, we're talking about in the intellectual underpinnings for, of their faith, you know. 
Uh, although in some cases, in some issues, I suppose, uh, if you ask some people to evaluate uh, their, their, their lifestyle in comparison to others' lifestyle, it might be a way to, to uh, undermine that faith. In fact, uh, and in fact, any woman who uh, wants to be a woman um, should reject all religion. I mean, I th <laughs> that's my opinion of the, of the matter because they, they, they're, they're treated uh, so badly, you know, by most other, all other religions. But they don't. So we need, uh, I mean, some of them don't. So we need a, a, a test to, to examine the, the underpinnings of any sexist or, or uh, misogynist type of thing. In fact, that's one of the main things I write when I write. Uh, I'm appalled by how religion treats women. I'm just utterly appalled. I don't write a lot about it, but that's one of the major reasons why I do what I do, because I hate what it does to women. And I figure that if I can get rid of the religion, or, you know, you can't, I know, I know, but if I can help to eliminate the effects of the religion on morality, then I think uh, uh, that, uh, that can uh, help in the ethics in the society as well. Ma'am? Some, for some, it's such a social thing, and they get connected because it's a social thing, and then they're addicted because it's the social thing, not always because of what's preached. So I think it's opportunities like this where we can get together, we can learn, and we can grow, um, and hopefully create our own mini groups and grow those mini groups, right? I mean, we have to plant the seeds and then you know, add water and, you know, make those flourish to, you know, bring more people to the social side. I agree. I think that one of the things that maintains religion in the world is also that um, by not questioning your inherited faith, you are able to stay within the confines of your social grouping. And I think that um, as long as you stay within the confines of your social grouping, then there's a safety net there. And I think there's an evolutionary basis to that. Um, if you uh, qu were to question or do some other kind of behavior um, that uh, your social grouping wouldn't allow, then in, uh, you could be ostracized and you could die in, in the wild, you know, that kind of stuff. So um, that may be one of the main things that keeps people in, in their religion because they, they evolved trait to stay within the, the confines of your own society. But and at the same time, if you have truth on your side, you know, and what I mean by that is, you know, if you're, if you're open-minded enough to accept the scientific evidence for religion, that's why I define open-mindedness as that, then it does help still to uh, solidify the, the beliefs that, you know, that you've uh, accumulated afterward. I mean, the society does have a way of justifying things, whether we like it or not. I mean, it's just the way it is. David Eller in his book, Advanced, uh, Atheism Advanced, says the only truly independent thinker is a solitary one. Otherwise, you, you know, you, it's just not too long before you fall into groupthink about anything. Uh, but it, 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 it's not groupthink if you have truth behind it. The scientific consensus, for instance, is not groupthink um, uh, by that same standard because um, there's evidence, sufficient evidence for what they've concluded, you know, and especially that little map I showed earlier. Anything else? Okay, nobody started to leave yet. That's good. <laughs> All right, I said that earlier. Now, um, how many minutes do I have so I know how fast to keep going? You have about 20 minutes. Oh, I got 20 minutes. Oh, sorry about your luck. Sucks to be you. <laughs> All right, now, here we go. Uh, I don't even know why. I just like to roll these things up. I could have probably put them all in one slide. Now, here are their options. Now, I'm not just talking about Christian options. It could be, you know, any religion's options. But, you know, since I know more about Christianity, then uh, I uh, focus on that. But it would be about any religious faith options. Um, you have to show that the test, that is the test I showed earlier, that you should have examined your faith from the same standards as a non-believer that you do to the faith you reject. You've got to show it's either faulty or unfair. And provide a better alternative. See, let's say, let's say you show it's faulty and unfair to some degree. Let's say if you, even if you could do that somewhat, you still have to provide a better uh, alternative. Uh, and then subject, and then after that, after you um, um, uh, do that and you can't find any fault or, you, you know, it's, uh, that it's not unfair uh, and therefore not provide a better alternative, therefore you must subject your faith to the test and, and either passes or it doesn't. Oh, there it is. 
That's it. That's, that's what they've got. Now, it's interesting to me that most all of the time when a Christian or a believer or otherwise uh, encounters this test, they object to it. And maybe it's because I'm an atheist. <laughs> you ever thought about that? Yeah, I have. Um, but they, uh, it's not just me saying this, um, but most of the time they object to it. Because I told you, I swear, if I told you that you had to tie your shoes before you get, after you get out of bed in the morning, they might object to that too. <laughs> All right, come on, I'm just being a little silly. Um, now, if you're a Christian, don't be offended. Uh, you know, I've got a lot of other things to tell you <laughs> too. <laughs> um, so, and uh, by the way, almost all of my friends are believers. Almost all. So, I, you know, all, all my family, they're all believers. You know, I, I'm not, uh, and I hardly ever talk to them about faith because it uh, would be uh, pretty obnoxious. And, and uh, although I know they, I'm not afraid to tell them what I, what I think when they ask it. So, is the test faulty? Uh, one objection is called the genetic fallacy. Uh, and, and that is, uh, you, you, they claim that the, uh, the origination of a belief is not an indicator that, it d does not falsify that belief. It, the origination of a belief doesn't falsify it. So they specifically target mama's need. And they say, just because your mama taught you your religion doesn't mean she taught you what's false. Okay? Now, I grant that. I'm not actually saying that uh, because uh, all religions are, are taught on mama's knees that they're all false. I'm not saying that because then I would fall into that, that fallacy. And they would say, aha, gotcha. No, I'm saying this. Because all religions are uh, contra mutually contradictory religions are taught on mama's knees, uh, therefore you ought to be skeptical of what your mother taught you. And that's for emphasis. That's, I, 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 have a, I, I paid him earlier just to make that. Uh, just because, so just because you uh, taught, were, were, learned your religion on your mama's knee, um, it, you could still be correct. She could still be correct. It's just that the odds, see, we're talking about the odds. The odds are, given the proliferation of so many other religions that are mutually exclusive, that um, you ought to be skeptical of it. Uh, so, uh, it's ir irrelevant. It's just simply irrelevant, the, the genetic fallacy thing. And it's also false because of that. I'm, I'm not claiming they're false because of how they originated, just that we should be skeptical. And you can consider the tabloids. How many of you like buy the tabloids, you know, and like to read those? My mom did. That's what it tells you what I was raised with. Um, and I love her, but she just loved those tabloids. Um, now, someone could say, well, um, this, this tabloid article is, uh, is wrong just because it's in the tabloid uh, art, you know, magazine without knowing anything else about it. You, you could reasonably do that by saying it's probably false, even without knowing anything else, because that's the, the, uh, the nature of how we generalize uh, from past experiences, and that's how we generalize from truth claims that we've already seen uh, uh, debunked. So it's not based on a genetic fallacy. Is it self-defeating? Well, it's not self-defeating to say the odds are that we're, we're wrong. I mean, you can't be. Well, you, they're saying, well, you're self-defeating because you're, you, you're doubting doubt. No, to doubt doubt is to, is to have faith. I mean, that's really what it means. A double negative is to, to actually have faith. I'm not having faith. It's doubting. And I'm doing the same thing you're doing to the other religions you reject. So how can you claim that that's you know, uh, self-defeating when you uh, look at the odds of the other faiths that you object? So, I mean, I only went through that really quick. But it's in my book, and, uh, and uh, you can read it if you want. So is the test unfair? Well, the test should be equally applied to atheism. Otherwise, the test unfairly targets religious faith for uh, criticism. Now, how can you equally apply a, that test to doubt? How can, you, how can you apply that test to doubt? Well, I should doubt doubt. Like I said, when you doubt doubt, you're just simply saying you should believe, and I'm not asking that at all. What claim is the doubter making? What can even that mean to say you should doubt doubt? And some skeptics, uh, some Christians will say they're skeptics, you know. Well, we're skeptics. We're skeptics of skepticism. That's what they do. We're skeptics of skepticism. And so that means that they're better skeptics than the rest of us. But those are empty word games. That's what they are. And uh, it, what, it, what their bottom line is doing is that they're just simply um, believing the lies of their brain. Because we know their brains are lying to them. We know this. Uh, because that's what it does, simply because it makes you um, uh, continue to believe and uh, stay within the safety uh, net of your social grouping. 
Now, we are non-believers, and that's all there is to it. Uh, we can't subject these non-beliefs to any further testing. And, um, and so that, uh, that doesn't, we, we just simply can't uh, do that. So when Christians ask if I have taken the outsider test for my own belief system, I say, yes, I have. That's why I'm a non-believer. And uh, what, would be, what would be the uh, outsider perspective that they would choose as an alternative? Would it be Catholicism or Protestant fundamentalism? I've chosen agnosticism. Is it pers the perspective of snake handlers, holy rollers, or the obnoxious and racist KKK? Is it the, that of a saint, satan, a Satanist, a Scientologist, a Shintoist, or a Sikh? What about that of a Mormon, a militant Muslim, or a Muni? How about Judaism, Jainism, and Jehovah's Witnesses? The problem is that there isn't a worthy religious contender from out of the myriad number of religions that can be considered an outsider perspective for non-believers, because non-believers is the, the outsider perspective when it comes to all of those different um, religions. And is the test unfair? Should the uh, test be equally applied to morality? Um, and if not, the test unfairly targets religious faith for criticism. Now this is, this is something I need to read because um, uh, I think this uh, criticism is actually fair, uh, at least to a point. Uh, if you were to look at a world map of ethic, uh, ethics, uh, you would see more harmony in that world map than you see religious diversity. Not that you would uh, see uh, 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 ethical diversity, you'd see plenty of it. But when it comes to some things, like taking care of your parents, you know, loving your sister, um, um, uh, being fair in your financial um, dealings, you know, th those sorts of things, you would find that uh, you know, people have a, have a lot of agreement on that. I think C.S. Lewis in his book, The Abolition of Man, makes some of those points. Um, so the, the moral diversity isn't as great to begin with. Now we can just discuss that if you wish, but that's what I think. Two, um, religious diversity is one of the main reasons why there is moral diversity. Okay? If we get rid of the religion, then we won't have as much moral diversity because religion is one of the main reasons there is so much moral diversity. Uh, and uh, another one uh, for, I skipped one, what if cultural relativism is actually the result of taking the outsider test for faith and morality? What, what if actually, if what you do when you judge all uh, moralities from the standard of an outsider, what if what the result is that you, you come with uh, moral relativism, moral and cultural relativism. Well, my response is, so what? One should never reject the evidence for something because the conclusion isn't one that's desired. Um, just simply bite the bullet, you know, and, and learn what cultural relativism is, is and, and um, um, uh, go with that. In fact, cultural rel relativism might actually be the case. If you look at the evidence from evolution, uh, you know, you, you don't find an absolute standard of morality for all species on the, on the planet. There is no one absolute morality for all species, and so therefore it might just be the case that cultural relativism is the case, and we do know that some uh, animal species beyond ourselves do have and, and, and have act, acted with care towards the others. Um, and anthropology professors all testify to cultural relativism. They're the ones who do the field work. And when they do the field work, they come back as cultural relativists. Uh, so we ought to listen to what they have to say. And uh, thirdly, I don't really find any way that's, uh, you, I, don't, I don't see any way you can intellectually uh, find an inconsistency with cultural relativism. I had a professor friend of mine, a colleague, who said that uh, cultural relativism cannot be refuted. So uh, it just might be the case that cultural relativism is the case and that the outsider test of faith might show that all uh, morals are culturally relative. But a lot of people don't understand what that view is. I'm not exactly sure whether it's true, but there's a lot of evidence that points in that direction. It just all may be uh, cultural relativism all the way down. All right. All right, there it is. Um, so if the test isn't faulty or unfair, uh, uh, then uh, you need to take it. G.K. Chesterton, he was the guy who wrote the book The Ever Everlasting Man that convinced um, C.S. Lewis, you know, you remember heard, you heard of him, to believe. And he said that we ought to look, he said we ought to look at Christianity from the outside like we were Chinamen. Uh, so if, um, if uh, Christians say, well, I don't like this test, well, quote G.K. Chesterton 
uh, to them from, uh, from the everlasting man. Now, so there are Christians who do adopt it. There was a, there was a guy I debated two days ago. His name is um, um, Wallace Marshall. He's got, a PhD, he's got a PhD from Princeton, and um, it went okay. Um, but afterward, he said, I read your book on the outsider test of faith, and he's actually the first Christian uh, intellectual who uh, has embraced the outsider test of faith. And uh, that's pretty cool. good. They, all the rest of them are just uh, rejecting it. That doesn't mean that, doesn't mean that uh, it, it, he has a high ground just because he's embraced it, just because he's accepted it. But it does mean something. So uh, that's, uh, I'm not going to go through that. It looks like I've got five minutes left. But these tests don't work. I've written about them in the book. The success test is interesting, though. David Marshall says that uh, here's a test for faith, the one that survives and grows. Well, if that's the case, Mormonism is growing, Scientology is growing, and Islam is growing. That's just ridiculous why he even suggested that. So um, the whole reason most Christians object to taking the test is because they intuitively know their faith will not pass it. And that's the, that's the bottom line. It's an emotional argument, not um, a, a fair one. So the last point is, uh, you know, either it passes or it doesn't. If no test, if no religion passes the outsider test for faith, it's not the fault of the test. Uh, the, and I say the correct religion should pass it. Just imagine a God who wants us to believe not making the evidence for that religion sufficient enough to convince a non-believer. Just think what that says. You know, and yet Christians are objecting to the test and they don't understand that they're, what they're saying is that their God did not give the sufficient evidence needed for non-believers to accept the faith, faith especially when hell is the, the uh, potential uh, result of that. And uh, what's the result? I uh, argue no revealed re religion passes the test. Religion itself probably cannot survive. Um, but that's my conclusion. And uh, I know that the Christians will object to that because that is my conclusion. And so they've, uh, they've objected to it precisely because that's my, my conclusion. But that, my conclusion is not part of the test. You know, you have to show that the test is either faulty or unfair on its own terms. And then we can debate about the conclusion. I just mentioned Wallace Marshall. He, he says the outsider test of faith is, is, uh, is a good, and I embrace it. Um, so now we have some, um, some uh, common ground. And I think faith is shown to be irrational. And the very last chapter in the book is, uh, is about the faith uh, being irrational. So if they assert that the faith passes the test, then at least we agree that it should. We should give them a, 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 you know, a, a shout out. Um, I do argue they're fooling themselves. They don't like me saying that. But it is true. It's an emotional argument. Um, they're, uh, they're fooling themselves just as much as Scientologists are. I cannot believe that, uh, and people say, well, Scientology is so bizarre of a belief, if you understand it, or Mormonism is so bizarre of a belief. Well, I'm sorry, uh, if, you, if you were to think of Christianity from the very first moment uh, that you actually heard the story, let's say you never heard it before, and all of a sudden some, someone comes up to you and tells you the story about like a triune God who sends himself down to, as a born of a virgin, and uh, you know, why? To, to uh, crucify himself so that you could be sin, saved from sins, and he went back up, he levitated back up into heaven. You, you would think that too is bizarre. I mean, seriously, bizarre. They're not any different, not any different at all. And then um, the point is, let the debates begin, because now they've agreed to shoulder the burden of proof, once they accept the test. Now they've, now they've agreed not to let faith enter the picture, you know, until, uh, until the, the evidence sh uh, shows otherwise. And if the evidence shows otherwise, then at that point they don't believe either. Because as soon as the evidence shows that something is true, you don't believe it anymore, you know it. You know it to a certain degree of probability. Stamp a, stamp a number to that. I, I know it because it's 85% uh, you know, the case. Or I know it because it's 90% of the case. Or I know it because it's 75%. At that point, you know it by different degrees of probability. You don't believe it anymore. So belief never enters the picture at all. And that's me. Thank you so much. I'll be around. <laughs>